Hi, everybody. Good morning. How's it going today? The local time is 8.48, and we will begin Session A of the crazy Eocene A to Z at 9 o'clock. So, if you're live with us, great. Looks like we have 250 people already ready to go. But if you're watching this in replay, of course, you can go ahead 11 minutes. Just scrub ahead 11 minutes, and you don't have to watch this first 11 minutes where I just say hi to people and make sure that we're, we're functional. So thanks for joining us. I'm going to pop the chat out like a boss. Got two laptops working simultaneously. No big deal. Got a whole new setup here. May not look like it, but I do. So let's say hi to some folks this morning. Make sure that we are functional. Are we five by five, first of all? And if so, then uh, where are you viewing from this morning? And we'll, uh, we'll just chit chat a few minutes here. Here's to you for joining us. Dennis is in Ottawa, Canada. Joe's in Tampa, Florida. Scrolling too fast. Adele from Disco Park. Thank you for everything, Adele, as always. Uh, I see some 5x5, five five, so that's encouraging. Laurie's 7x7 uh, seven seven in Southern Oregon. Oh, my heaven's sakes. I can't keep up with this scroll here. Uh, Regine's in France. God, i got to take matters by the... Hang on, hang on. Patrick, hang on. I gotta slow this down. I gotta scroll back. It's too fast. Uh, Devon's in Omac. Shannon, hello. Hermiston, Oregon. Dansville, New York. Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Jurica from Croatia. Looking forward to the lecture. Thank you. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Jim in Lebanon, Oregon. Scott in Henderson, Nevada. Uh, hey, Clint, coast to coast. Clint. Is that you? There was a guy named Clint who drove from Florida up here to the Pacific Northwest, hung out for a few months, sat in on my lecture class, and just took off because the weather was turning. Clint, if that's you, um, we need to talk. Can you email me, please, Clint? I'm not sure I've got your email address. If you're the right Clint that I'm talking about. Hope I didn't out you there. Clint from Florida, that's as specific as I need to be. But Clint, we need to talk. Uh, thank you for what you slipped under my door there, but we need to talk about that. Hector's in Cal Kalamazoo, Michigan. Grammy by the lake, Shalan. Yuki's 5x5. Five five. In other words, I'm not live. I'm, I'm back a ways because I just wanted this live chat to, to slow down so I could read some of this stuff. It's great to have you all with us. I didn't know how many would show up. It's been a while since we've done this. Manitoba, Canada. Mankato, Minnesota. I'm just going to look for place names now. Missouri. Sonora, California. White Salmon, Washington. Hello to all of you. Forest Grove, Oregon. France. The Metal. Shirani in the house. Amanda's in Los Angeles. Cyclical Cycler in Denmark. Ben in the Netherlands. Kirk's in Philomath, Butler, Missouri. Craters of Diamonds State Park in Arkansas. Saber, you're on the road. Hey, man. Oh, I'm all automatic scroll down to, to live. And it's slowed down so I can read now. Hackney, UK. Chico, California. Menominee, Michigan. North Scani Nerd. <laughs> Leslie from near Boston. Cindy here from Tremont, California. It's foggy in Portland. Yeah, it's about, we got sun this morning. It's about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. We've had steady rain, cold November rain here for the last week which is, I guess, typical this time of year, but, you know, we're on the east side of the Cascade, so we don't get a lot of soaking rain day after day, but we've had it the last few days, so I'm glad we're indoors here today. Uh, Janica from uh, the, the, the Netherlands. Uh, McCar S. McCarthy, from, or Steve, in Barrow in Furness, UK. I love to see the distant land. Algeria. Uh, Miriam Tellall. Hello from Algeria. Well, hello from the USA. Santa Paula, California. 
first snow here in Dayton, Ohio. Is that right? Huh, interesting. Shelly's in Afreda, Washington. Matt's in Napa, Oregon. Is this guy going to start? Yeah, I am, but in uh, five minutes or so. Uh, Zuzana from Czechia. Hello. Stephanie from Great Yarmouth, UK. Dick from the Netherlands. It's pitch black, pitch dark here, almost uh, 6 p.m. Thanks for joining us as always, Dick. Uh, Glenn's in Falkirk, Scotland. Todd's from San Clemente, California. Good morning, Todd. Mike's in Red Deer, Alberta with a Canadian flag and a weather report. Freezing rain. Sounds delightful. Doug's a flatlander from Illinois. Kent, Jackson, Louisiana. All right, well, oh, why not? We've got a few more minutes. You know, I think I'm going to start these uh, maybe not even 10 minutes before the hour, maybe even five minutes before the hour. I don't know. I'm getting cocky. Uh, of course, I've jinxed it. But as I'll discuss with everybody once we start at the top of the hour, um, I haven't had Internet crashes here at school. And I've only really had one significant bump, buffer thing, and I think that lasted just a minute or two. So I don't know if I'm going to be... Uh, starting these 20 minutes before the top of the hour necessarily because um, I'm feeling pretty confident that I don't have to check for five by five all the time. Now, of course, the first, you know, it's been six months since I've done this, so it took me a while to figure out even how to set this up again. Uh, but once we get rolling, I, I, I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'll be starting 10 minutes to the hour at the earliest and maybe even five minutes to the hour. It is nice to say hi to people, though, so maybe... Maybe I need to change my tune. Oh, German chocolate cake, Mrs. Bijou. Oh, Bijou is uh, doing quite well. Thank you for asking. And uh, I will talk to everybody at the top of the hour about why we're here and not at home. Matthews in Douglas, Arizona. Uh, Les enjoys the introductions. No more cozy tent. <laughs> cozy tent. That's right. We move forward. Hi, Jennifer in Boise. Good to hear from you. You're a regular. GLG in Virginia. Yeah, I'll do a few more hellos. Still got three minutes, four minutes, something like that. Lincoln City, Oregon. Marlboro, Massachusetts. We're up to 500 people. Wow. Pretty good for being off for so long. It's really wonderful to see so many of you here. <laughs> uh, Randy's doing fine. Thanks. Uh, Maury Longo, uh, many of these are familiar names, so some of this, uh, again, I'll save it for three minutes from now. Uh, yeah, you want to take your notes? There, there's, not much to, there's not much to copy down here today. Mike says that I'm fuzzy on his tablet, but fine in the Roku. Good to know. There's plenty of technology to play with, including uh, myself here, and I'm, I'm going to break into it slowly. Michelle is in New Zealand, 5x5 five five down here, too. Uh, I did, I keep wanting to say stuff that I want to say to everybody, but I, I want to start in a few minutes. I'm just still saying hi to folks. Michael Teal, Washington, uh, 542, it's a Saturday morning. I suppose uh, time zones are an issue. Some people maybe tuned in uh, an hour ago or three hours ago or will tune in five hours from now expecting to see this thing live. This is Pacific time. Gordon, great to be back. Great to have you back, Gordon. Were you in Scotland, I think? Uh, Mina in uh, Stanwood. Lisa's in Randall, Washington. Uh, Lissa and Dr. John from Newport, Oregon. David's Mississippi and Limestone here. That could be a number of places. Sunny Southern Utah. That sounds delightful, Thomas. Selma, Oregon. Olaf in Switzerland. What's up, homie? Uh, running on empty says good morning from Chile, Wisconsin. Kent, uh, hello from McKinney, Texas. Aurelio Perez, hi again from 
Valladolid, Spain, or words to that effect. Great to have you. Okay, just wonderful to be with you all again. Uh, give me two minutes to get my head right here. I'll take a little walk around the classroom. The building's totally empty, but I don't have time to go walking down the hall necessarily. But uh, people keep trickling in, and I think we're good. So thanks for joining us. We'll start in uh, one minute. Hot mic. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is the beginning of a brand new live stream series. I'm calling it the Crazy Eocene. Trademark, copyright. I stole the phrase, the Crazy Eocene, from this book. The second edition of the Roadside Geology of Washington, co-authored by Marley Miller and her former advisor at the University of Washington, Daryl Cowan. And as I've gotten to know those guys, I've understood how they have put this book together. And on page 232, there is a title here that caught my eye whenever I first read it two years ago, something like that, The Crazy Eocene Epoch. And I like it. So our goal today, with an episode conveniently called Goals, is to first of all just talk about this live stream operation, why I'm here, why I'm doing another one of these A to Z series, what's in it for me, what's in it for you, what's in it for anybody, why bother? It's Saturday morning, there's nobody here. It's a ghost town. Got the whole building to myself. I'm in this lecture hall that I've used uh, every morning, pretty much. We're about two-thirds of the way through the academic quarter here at CWU. I got 75 students in here every, t every morning at 10 o'clock. It's great. And so why am I coming in on a Saturday morning? And why will I be with you Wednesdays? So if you haven't caught it yet, we're doing two live streams a week starting this morning. This is session A. Session B will be Wednesday at 2 p.m. Session C will be a week from this morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, you know. So, so we're going to talk about why I'm, why I'm doing this. Uh, I also need to uh, help us understand why we're talking about the Eocene. What is the Eocene? When was the Eocene? Why should I care about the Eocene? I've never even heard the word, you say. And then before we quit this morning, I do want to share with you a number of things that are in my sights, some targets where I want to do some learning. So that quickly gets us into the why we're doing this to begin with. So I have to pause just another second. I don't know why. I just proudly said with the early arrivals that I'm not worried about technology, but now of course I am because I'm talking in a regular voice. I don't have people in the room, so I want to make sure. Are we five by five here? I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just gonna hold off. Alice is in Canada. Uh, see your little earth icon there. 
uh, are we doing okay? Even with this this voice, you know, I, I'm, I've been screaming so much the last, I've been screaming through a mask and the whole thing, you know, this this feels great. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so we're in the first part. And warning, there's going to be talking about myself here. But I have to, I think I have to, especially for the new arrivals, and I think many of you are new to us. I don't think you've been with us live before. Maybe you've watched some of these in replay and from, from earlier times, but maybe you're new. And so, first of all, welcome, everybody especially. Uh, let me say that differently. Welcome to everybody, of course. I hope you feel like this is some sort of uh, sane community. does feel like there's plenty of insanity going on in many different communities around the world. Hopefully you feel like this is some sort of sane place to be, positive place to be, welcoming place to be. And occasionally we have a crackpot in the live chat, but uh, they're ignored. Well, the, the group kind of polices itself. So I hope that you, if nothing more, get kind of a, a positive kick out of being with us, either live or in replay, with this group of people who are simply just trying to learn new things. And that's myself included. I'm learning plenty on my own, but I'm also learning plenty from you guys. But if you're brand new to us, like brand brand new, like who is this guy? What, what, what is this? I just stumbled onto this. I saw some post on Instagram that this thing was happening this morning, and I tuned in just for just for fun. Well, I teach at this university, Central Washington University, and I've been here for 30 years, and I've been teaching basically 101 for 30 years, and 101 lab, and some field courses, and occasionally I teach an upper division class, uh, Geology 351, where we focus on some research. And that, you know, and a little bit of video stuff here and there. But a year and a half ago, well, we're coming up on two years, aren't we? March of 2020, I mean, we're, we're, I can just kind of say two years, I guess. We're coming up on two years at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's significant here because I started live streaming from my home. Speaking of sanity, I just started live streaming from home to keep myself sane and to, to feel like I was doing something productive. Now, that doesn't look like sanity to me. But my point is, uh, going back almost two years ago, I started broadcasting using an iPhone. That phone right there. This is all I've been using for the last two years. And 75 live streams from home, five of them a week during the most intense part of the lockdown here in the U.S or at least Washington State. And so I'm just trying to give you a background on who I am and what you are joining. You're joining a community of people who were joining us every night in uh, the spring of 2020. And I, was, I wasn't learning anything new except technology. I was just you know, using food props and other ways to communicate with, I was imagining talking to families, a bunch of, you know, moms and dads or moms and moms or whatever and they're home and they got kids and they're just trying to you know get a little bit of learning going on virtually so that was a community that was kind of built from scratch essentially and by the end uh, we did a craters of the moon live stream from home and I think there were like 1500 people that were watching live that last Sunday morning and it felt really good and there was a nice Nice kind of wrap up to that. Okay, moving on, I started videotaping again using the phone from the field. Um, I called them Nick on the Fly, kind of a dopey title, but I was visiting some exotic terrains. Then last fall, I started doing an exotic terrain A to Z series, and that's the format we're going to use again uh, today. So right off the bat, that was still from home, and I was having problems with my phone. It felt like, I don't know, every third session, uh, the thing would just crash, and I'd start from scratch. I'd start a whole new live stream, like I'd put all this work into preparing these exotic terrain series uh, shows, and then, you know, the, the thing is freezing, and my voice is choppy, and again, in some cases, 
uh, again, I'm using wireless on my phone on a Larry the Ladder in the backyard, and I'm working with Mappy McMap and all this sort of stuff. And I just, you know, even the last show, the grand finale, where we were kind of talking about the whole thing right before Christmas, the thing crashes again. And I remember talking specifically into the camera from home. I said, if I ever do more of these live streams, I'm not going to do it with my phone. I just can't handle these blorps, these crashes. And so since then, I really haven't been, li been live streaming at all using my phone. I've been using my phone to record things from the field, even this last summer. But the live streaming thing, I don't feel like I can rely on that wireless, either, either at home or at school. We're still here. So starting last winter, winter of 2021, I started using this classroom. And everyone was in quarantine here at the university. And I had this idea that I would live stream my Geology 101 classes for my students. But everyone was invited. I thought maybe I'd get my hand slapped, but I didn't. I've been doing enough stuff where the higher ups here, the well-dressed people, just have allowed me to continue to do this sort of thing without uh, chastising me. Grateful for that. And eventually the students came out of quarantine in mid-January and then I started dealing with these 20 kids who are sitting in this huge auditorium that seats 120. And they're all socially distanced and masks and everything. So that seemed like it worked well. So then last spring, still giving you background on what this is and what we're about to do, I had a community that continued, in other words, from my backyard to now this more reliable high-speed internet. I think it's high-speed. It's satisfactory, at least. And then last spring, in this classroom, same idea, about 20 kids spread out throughout the room, we did Geology 351. And we focused on the Eocene. And so now we're looking at scientific papers. Now we're working back and forth Ryan, the former car mechanic, and Rhiannon, and, and uh, Bryce, the rock licker, and all of these people become kind of, the students become characters now because I'm filming them out in the field. Kind of a no-no, but whatever. So the Geology 351 thing was a, a tremendous experience as well. That's the last time that I've live streamed. I signed off in early June of 2021, last live stream, heartfelt, thank you for everything, and and then I haven't live streamed since then. So it's been six months since I've been here standing, looking into a camera live and talking directly to you. I've done some pop-up things and other things, but this, this business about just me and you, look, you know, here we are. Um, it's been a while. Last comment, just technology-wise. I thought maybe I'd do this from home again. Like, I thought this morning maybe I'd be from home. But for the last two weeks, I've been testing all sorts of options, and I like this setup. I like the lighting. Ideally, we're outside. Ideally, I'm in the backyard with Bijou the cat and everything, but uh, the internet speed is just not great, and I, I'm using these laptops now, and I have a multi-camera setup, although I'm not using it this morning, I don't think. Um, so that's, that's a long-winded way of saying that's why we are here, and really, uh, I... I think one of the charms of what we're doing is I have no idea. What session B? I don't know. Isn't that Wednesday? Yeah. You don't know? No. I don't have no idea how we're going to proceed through the alphabet. And I like to stay as loose and kind of receptive as possible. So you might have some comments as I watch this replay later this weekend. I go, well, that's an idea. Maybe I'll explore that. So in other words, it is kind of a two-way street. And we will work our way through this alphabet talking about the Eocene epic. And that's coming. Why are we talking about the Eocene? But um, there is no rigid plan. And I, I, I like that, that aspect of it. Okay, I think that's the end there. The only other thing I'll say is what's in this for me and what's in this for you? Well, I like to learn new things. And I have a list. I don't think it's a written list, but it's kind of a mental list. Like, oh, boy, I really should do that. I really should sit down and learn that. And, you know, you know how that goes. We're all busy people. So it just kind of stays on my mental list. And it bugs me. It bugs me that I don't, for instance, the Rocky Mountains. 
It's been 30 years since I've thought seriously about the Rocky Mountains. And I'm going to share with you this morning before we quit what I know about the Rocky Mountains, which is 30 years old. It'll be embarrassing to draw it out for you, but I'm going to draw it out for you. I'm a brave boy. So what's in this for me? I'm going to learn new things. More specifically, what's in it for me, and if you're a veteran now of these past programs, you know about this already, but this is a group of three geologists, Bob Miller from San Jose State University, Mike Eddy from Purdue University, Stacia Gordon from University of Nevada in Reno. This is a North Cascades research team, five-year program, working in the North Cascades. The brightest of the bright, the most experienced of the experienced, what? And I'm part of the team. It's a small role, but I'm, I'm part of the team to be the public outreach person for them. And so I, will, I filmed them a little bit out in, the, out in the North Cascades last summer. Maybe you saw those videos. They're on my website, on my YouTube channel, if you want to visit with these guys. But my primary motivation is to keep up with these guys. I'm going to be interviewing them. I'm going to be doing live events with them, pop-up stuff, uh, audio podcast. I need to know, I need to understand what they're talking about. I need to understand what they're doing. And I am deficient in many areas involving the North Cascades. Now, I feel good about making progress in the last year. I know way more about the North Cascades than I did a year ago. But there's still miles and miles and miles to go, or kilometers and kilometers, kilometers to go. So that's what's in it for me. I will push myself to learn new things and share it with you. What's in it for you? Well, I hope it's obvious. One, I hope this feels like a nice place to be. You've chosen to be with other people who are like-minded and want to learn new things. And B, I suppose it's the actual learning. And the North Cascades is not an easy place. So I have a role, I think, to make this very complicated, highbrow science accessible to everyone, understandable to everyone. And my working model is, if I can get it to work for this noggin, I think I can get it to work for yours. Now, many of you are much brighter than I. And some of you know way more about the North Cascades right now, this morning, than I do. I'm fine with that. But even those that have no interest in geology, no background in geology, you are welcome here and hopefully you feel a sense of motivation and connectedness and maybe you're reading some of these science papers on your own, for goodness sake. That's the why for you, at least that's my hope. Okay, I think it's time to do something real, don't you? All right, so that's the why, check. We're gonna focus on the Eocene. What is the Eocene? This is going away. Super wordy. What does this even mean? Specific concepts needing updates and knowledge? What a clown. Okay, now your notebooks are out. I don't know if your notebooks need to be out today at all, to be honest with you. I'm just trying to set the table. I'm just trying to set the tone. And it won't be quite the slow buildup that we did with the exotic A to Z series. It took us six shows before we even started visiting any exotic terrain. I don't think I want to do that this time. I think I want to get to it a little bit sooner than later. But the Eocene is a chapter in our geologic past. It's a portion of the geologic time scale. So we have these four major eras. You've heard of like the Paleozoic era, for instance, or the Mesozoic. Hey. Here's an old friend for some of you. What I call, I've got pet names for everything. I don't remember what I called this. Is it magic time stick? I don't know. So, Beginning of the Earth, 4.6 billion years ago, that's the Precambrian. 541 million years ago, that's the beginning of the Paleozoic era. 
252 million years ago. Now we get into what's known as the Mesozoic era, subdivided into periods, the Triassic period, the Jurassic period. Heard of it, Jurassic Park. Have you ever seen it? Cretaceous period. And the dates that are corresponding, come on, man. What the? Reversed image on my screen. Uh, 252 million years ago, 201 million years ago, 145 million years ago, 66, big, big event. And then the Cenozoic era. So, wait a minute, I don't see Eocene on this thing. What the hell? Sorry, Patrick. Well, when talking about the exotic terrains, Again, many of these, some of you old timers will remember. <laughs> these are the actual colored pencil things that I found in a box uh, last week. So when we were working on the exotic terrain series and talking about accumulating or accreting these exotic terrains, you might remember, that, well, it's going to take me a while to get used to this reverse thing. Kind of forgot about this. I'm not looking into a phone now. I'm looking right into this Brio Logitech, no big deal. Do you remember the, ex did you see the exotic terrain A to Z series? Okay, and you're still with us, so that must have worked somehow for you. I was proud of that. I like that format. I like that A to Z format. I, I never had that in my mind before, but when we started that exotic terrain A to Z live stream series last September, September of 2020, I wanted to come up with a way to have people watch episodes build on the last one. In other words, if you showed up in session J, I don't think it made a whole lot of sense. You needed to watch A up through... You needed to watch the letters in order to have it make sense as a whole. I like that format. And you know what also I liked about the Exotic Terrain A to Z series last time, last fall? I liked, it. I liked the level we were discussing. Now, maybe for some of you it was too much over your head, went too fast. Maybe for some of you it was like, oh my God, this is a two-hour show and this guy's like looking for papers and stuff. Move it along. I don't know, but I liked it. It was perfect for my, the pitch, the level of our discussion was significant enough, was serious enough, was advanced enough to be satisfying for me. Like it was truly stuff that I didn't know and I was working very hard to make it accessible to everybody, visually. And I, I want to shoot for that zone again. Why did I get into that? I don't remember. So, if you recall, we had a magic time window with the Exotic Terrain series, 200 to 50. That was our magic time window last fall with the Exotic Terrain series. Almost all of our stories of accumulating or accreting exotic terrains and building the westernmost margin of North America happened between 250. That was our framing. And by the end, uh, by session W, X, Y, and Z, last December, before Christmas time, I think I was openly saying, I think I need to do another one of these live stream series. I think I'm, this is me talking last year, I think, I think there's so much going on up here at the youngest part of the magic time window from last fall. I said, I, I think I need to do another live stream series, and I think it needs to kind of pick up where we left off. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So technically, You can see the dates for the Eocene epic. So the Eocene epic is a subdivision within the tertiary period. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. So you don't see the word Eocene, but I suppose I'm going I'm to color this. I think when we're done, I'll sit down with a marker and I'll color this thing and have a new magic time window. And this is a little awkward. Technically, the Eocene epoch goes from 56 million years ago until 34 million years ago. And you're like, oh, 
Why? The, 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 the terrains are all here by that time, right? More or less, yeah. So why, why we're going to do 26 shows just in the Eocene? Yeah. It's the crazy Eocene. Why did Daryl Cowan call it the crazy Eocene? Don't overthink it. There was some crazy shit happening. Sorry, Patrick. There was some crazy stuff happening simultaneously here in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in the North Cascades. Oh, my God. It's a three-ring circus at minimum. So I am going to simplify our magic time window for this winter. Eocene, yes, but Eocene framed this way, between 60 and 40. That's what I'll do here. Almost all of our attention will be devoted to the time window between 60 and 40 million years ago. And I challenge you, as we go through the winter, to keep track of all this amazing, amazing geology happening here in the North Cascades between 60 and 40 million years ago. There's not enough shows. It's that active. Okay, that reminds me about this. I sometimes call them the dream team. I don't think I like it. They're humble people. They're about as smart as they come, but they're not pretentious. So dream team doesn't seem to fit. I need to, this is the North Cascades team. That's fine. But I mentioned that I'm part of the group. Mike Eddy, Stacia Gordon, Bob Miller. And I have their NSF proposal here. And I want to read you a couple of passages. And it's got some big words, some words that I don't understand. And there's a lot of pages here. And I, I uh, asked Mike for permission to share at least a little bit of this with you. And I'm doing so because I want to help you see how our work in this magic time window with our live stream sessions this winter will help me and maybe you get up to speed when we visit with these guys again. The North Cascades team, Mike, Stacia, and Bob. And I think once you get a taste of their proposal, so the idea is if you want a big research grant, you have to put a proposal together, just like you propose marriage while you're proposing to the National Science Foundation. And you say, will you please give me some money? Here's what I promise to do. Here are the scientific questions we have. And not everybody gets funded. In fact, most people don't. But this team was able to get funded during the pandemic, I might add. So it took way longer to wait for a green light on this project. So without further ado, just a little bit to give you a taste of what I'm trying to continue to learn on my own so that I can understand what these guys are talking about. Here we go. NSF Scientific Proposal, Collaborative Research, this is the title, Burning Down the House, Investigating the Relationships Between Magmatic Flare-Ups, Crustal Rheology, and Arc Collapse. How you doing? I had to Google rheology. <laughs> Turns out that's more of a physics term. Rheology, studying the flow of matter. You want me to spell it? Crustal rheology. Study, uh, it's kind of a studying the flow of matter, whether it's a liquid flow or a soft solid flow. I don't know, physics. Introduction. I'm not going to read 10 pages, but I'll read a little bit with you. This is these three guys talking to the National Science Foundation, hoping to get funding. Magmatic arcs represent a key area of mass transfer between Earth's mantle and crust through the addition of mantle-derived melts and the removal of dense cumulates and or ristite. In concert, these processes, combined with melting of crustal rock, are, generated, are considered to generate a bulk crustal composition that is andesitic, depleted in high field strength elements, and enriched in other incompatible elements. I understand about half of that. 
However, crust formation in magmatic arcs is not steady state, and large magmatic volumes can be emplaced over relatively short durations, like 5 million years. The factors that control both initiation and termination of these periods of higher than average magmatic addition rates, or magmatic flare-ups, remain controversial. Yet they are critical for our understanding of crust formation and modification, as well as the evolution of continental arcs. How you doing? You're like, I don't know. Are we really going to talk about this? Well, we are, but in my own little folksy way, you know. I just came off the farm. I got shit in my boots after shoveling manure in the barn. Let's go. In other words, I try to make things practical. I try to use visuals the best I can, even though I haven't done it so far today. We propose to undertake a detailed study of two magmatic flare-ups in the southernmost Coast Mountains Batholith of British Columbia and Northern Washington, within the North Cascades, Washington, USA, to understand how the arc crust evolved during and between these events. The North Cascades experienced three periods with high magma addition rates with the two most recent flare-ups at 78 to 60 million years ago and 50 to 45, ding, 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 million years ago. The end stages of the Eocene event were coeval with collapse of the arc and exhumation of deep arc crust. These exhumed high-grade rocks, metamorphic rocks, record a protracted history of metamorphism, deformation, and partial melting that spans the two younger flare-up events, and they provide an opportunity to understand the evolution of arc rheology through crustal levels of 0 to 40 kilometers depth during this time. This outstanding field location, in this outstanding field location, we will produce a high temporal resolution, in other words, less than one million year record of magmatism, associated with these two most recent flare-up events and, me and metamorphism, deformation, and exhumation of mid-crustal rocks, including cutting-edge, geochemical, geochronologic, thermobaromic, no, thermobarometric, and field techniques to provide a holistic understanding of magmatic flare-ups and how they affect the reality of the arc. Good Lord, am I really associated with these people? Yes. Do they talk like that when we're eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich next to the beautiful babbling mountain creek? No, they're real people. but they're talking to other geologists. They're speaking their language, a language that I barely understand. And you're like, oh, come on. You've been in geology for 30 years. That's true. But I don't operate in those circles. I don't speak the research talk 100%. Now, I can get by on a little coffee cart, say a few words, make sense of what's going on, and if you've seen me talk to these guys on camera, I ask regular questions. And it's sometimes challenging to talk to a guy talking regular language. It's very complicated stuff. And I'm going, so what are, why are the rocks uh, all exhumed? Or why did they all go up when they went down? And... But that's where I'm coming from. There's, uh, I, I was going to cut it off, but I'm going to do one more. Are we still here? We've got more than, a, we've got almost 1,100 watching now. Um, previous studies of flare ups have mainly focused on documenting the timing, the volume of magma, the cause of the magma addition rates. The data collected in this proposal will address a related and equally critical overarching question How does a flare up event affect the rheology of an arc? To address this question, we will collect results that focus on a subset of related questions, including, one, what is the temporal relationship between a weakened deep crust and flare-up magmatism? And what shall this, what can this tell us about internal versus external flare-up triggers? Two, what, okay, I'm done. Getting depressed reading it, okay? Excellent geologists, I can communicate with them they will be joining us live on occasion, on camera, 
more coming than that down the road once I get comfortable. But I hope you can see by reading that what I feel like my role is. It's more along these lines. Daryl Cowan, Marley Miller, they speak that language, but they have also chosen to speak plain English for us regular people in these beautiful roadside books with these beautiful maps by Chelsea and Marley. I have a role, and I have a lot of practice distilling that stuff into something that works here. So you're like, well, are you going to do it? Yeah. The rest of our time here this morning, I have 9.33. My goal is to make to be done lecturing, quote unquote, at the top of the hour. I want these to be an hour of content. That's my goal. I don't want it to be a two hour show. An hour. And then at the top of the hour, the bell will strike. Not really, but I'll try to wrap it up about the top of the hour and then we'll go to live q and A. I'm not gonna get off of that. That's really super helpful. But I want to tighten these up just a little bit. We'll see if it happens. So I've got 25 minutes to do whatever was the last thing on the, on the board, which was something like explore things I don't know about, basically. Somehow related to that proposal, but also other things that have just done my little mental list of things to do that I haven't quite gotten to. You ready? The big reveal for this morning. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll give you a second. There it is. It involves beautiful places, the North Cascades, photo by Backcountry Gary. Beautiful places, book by Ralph Hagerud, Roland Tabor. Beautiful rocks. Beautiful rocks. Okay. Before we get into this, I just I want to try it. I don't know. I'm feeling. I'm feeling something. Didn't work. Did it work? Didn't work. I'm using this thing called Melon, and it's a confusing, ah, shh. Am I here? Am I, am I pointing at the camera right now? And if I am, I'm not leaving it. I had this problem during the tests. I'm not using the other camera for the rest of the time. But I want to be back on this. See, Melon is, is, is backwards, and I had this problem before. Good God, why is this a problem? Why did I do this? Am I here? How are you supposed to answer that? I'm not going to proceed until you're telling me in the live chat that I'm, I'm pointing at you right now. Um, please write the word finger if my finger's coming right at you, not the bad finger. Please type finger, because I'm seeing the other camera right now. You see finger. Okay, thank you. Boy. Oh, man. So I can't even see myself right now, but you've all said fingers, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that I'm, I'm talking to you. I still see tons of fingers. Okay. So that's the end of that experiment. I'll be back later with that. Okay. So 
Let me try to comment on a few of these verbally, but I actually want to draw a couple things out. If you're experienced with the past programs, I've used the phrase main event to mean two different things. Like back in last fall, the main event was about 100 million years ago. But if you happen to see the Geology 351 shows last spring, I was using the phrase main event for about 50 million years ago. There's two main events. And I think I just decided right now that's what session B is going to be. <laughs> that's it. I think. I think I just decided. Wednesday at 2 p.m., this coming Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, session B of this live stream series, we will talk about the main events. And I'm going to need some help coming up with some analogies because I can't use this phrase, main event one, main event two, super awkward. But that is a major theme for the entire winter, these two main events. So I want to revisit that, and that will come next. Mike, especially, so let me give you, I read you some of the proposal. I still see fingers, so I'm just going to, I'll give you a fist. I can't see myself now. What? It, why? Okay, I'm flying blind, baby. I'm flying blind. Oh, maybe I can. Okay, I can see myself at least now. I can't see the camera settings, though. Whatever. Um, so Mike, the young guy, Purdue, is the magma guy. So magmatic flare-ups and incredibly precise dating using zircons pulled out of these granitic bodies, these plutons, and determining how much magma was coming into the crust in a very short amount of time. During the Eocene, for instance, that's going to be Mike. And so this magmatic flare-up thing I don't know anything about, and that's really Mike's role, one of Maine's Mike, Maine's Mike, wow. I'm thrown by this camera thing. Metamorphic rocks and exhumation, elevators going up and down, and sedimentary material being shed off to the side. That's what I mean here. This is Stacia Gordon. This is Stacia working with the Skagit Nice, for instance. This is Stacia working with thermal barometry. No idea what I'm talking about. Working with key minerals, garnets, that, re re that uh, only form at certain high temperatures and pressures. Bob, who is approaching 50 straight years of, I'm not kidding, 50 straight years of working in the North Cascades, is a f structural person. So he's kind of work, kind of works with everything here, uh, even these things called metamorphic core complexes. But I think of Bob mostly working with these shear zones uh, indicating a deformation or lateral or horizontal motion along strike slip faulting, dextral sense of offset but earlier sinistral sense of offset, whatever. We're going to get into that, too. So what I want to do for you before we quit and before I... I've already commented there. I've already commented there. I don't know much. I want to learn a lot about these uh, large volumes of magma that are in, uh, invading from below in a relatively short amount of time during the Eocene. If you joined us for the Geology 351 live streams, I've gotten a head start there. I know a fair amount now about the Chalice Magnus, thanks mostly to Jeff Tepper, University of Puget Sound. He may be with us this morning. And I realized as I was working with those papers that there is a lot of gold and silver other precious metal, silver and gold, silver and gold. 
Silver and gold decoration. Bro, Ives, trademark, copyright. What are these chalice magmas? Eocene time, by the way. Where are they? Why do almost all these Eocene plutons have gold and silver tied to them? Like the golden horn pluton up by Washington Pass in North Cascades. We can even be down to Liberty, Washington, north of Ellensburg, or Wenatchee. That was one of the goals of 351, was to make some sort of connection between the gold district in Wenatchee and the gold district in Liberty. It never got there. Got sidetracked by other interesting stuff, like Aaron Donaghy's sedimentary units, like the Chumstick Basin, which is just one big sandbox, more or less. So I've done some, some groundwork already, and I will be kind of reusing some of that work from 351, but kind of fashioning it together in a new way for this new series. Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... We might have a session on oceanic plateaus because the main event one and main event two, awkward, are tied to major ocean plateaus accreting to Western North America. I want to learn what I can about oceanic plateaus. I know next to nothing. And just understanding the basics of modern oceanic plateaus, in other words, oceanic plateaus that we have today in the Pacific, for instance. Shatsky Rise? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Tamu Massif? What? Just fragments of thoughts in my head, no real conscious understanding of any of that. But if we took, I don't know, maybe that's session C. I'm thinking out loud. Maybe session C, we look in the Pacific at some of these modern oceanic plateaus and realize their scale and why they're there, and maybe that will help us. You see how this is kind of a working, a working um, a process here? But what did I do in blue? These are the two things that I want to uh, spend the next 10 minutes discussing in lightning fashion, in lightning quick fashion. Metamorphic core complexes, Rocky Mountains, they're going to be part of this winter. And it's been 30 years since I've thought of either of them seriously. Back to my graduate school days, in Idaho State University, Pocatello, Idaho. I remember many field trips in the Rocky Mountains looking at metamorphic core complexes. They confused the hell out of me then, and I chalked it up to being new to geology. And I've kind of avoided them since then because I haven't had a reason to learn about them. But I think these metamorphic core complexes are going to be a crucial part of understanding what the North Cascades team is up to. I think there's a chance there's metamorphic core complex concepts in the North Cascades, even though that's not an obvious place to go to study a metamorphic core complex. And you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, I'm close to you. I know a few things, and I want to draw that right now. And same with the Rocky Mountains. I used to teach about the Rocky Mountains in Geology 101, first 15 years of my career. And I'm going to share that with you right now, just off the top of my head. I haven't used it in 15 years, but I did it so frequently, so often, when I taught a class called uh, Geology of U.S. National Parks, which I don't teach anymore because I'm in Washington. Why am I talking about mammoth caves? I'm in Washington. That was my thinking 15 years ago. But I knew none, I, I knew hardly any of the exotic terrain stuff that we know now, thanks to our work last fall. And the timing of the Rocky Mountains is, I'm 30 years out of date. And if I was a reasonable person and full of pride and reputation, I wouldn't share what I was teaching 20 years ago in the classroom. But I'm a big boy. So I'm going to write out right now what I used to teach, which is clearly wrong, but I want to document where I am in my head with the Rocky Mountains and how far I want to go 
this winter. Let's do it. Rocky Mountains first. No, uh, core complex is first. Uh, that camera thing, what am I doing wrong? Hang on. Yep. Okay. We'll do the metamorphic core complexes first because that is so uh, simple in my mind. I'll just have a few phrases for you that I think are still used, but I'm not sure. I do know some places that are known back then and are still known as metamorphic core complexes. Have you heard of the Pioneer Mountains in central Idaho? Have you heard of the Albion Range? And I guess it's southern Idaho, maybe northern Nevada. Uh, there's a metamorphic core complex in northern Washington maybe called the Republic Core Complex, I'm not sure. I think there's one called the Kettle, Nice Dome or something. I think that's a metamorphic core complex. There's dozens more. I can't even give you examples. But here's off the top of my head, the only thing I remember from 30 years ago. I remember how to spell metamorphic. Now, warning, most of this is wrong. Most of this is outdated, but I'm sharing, you understand what I'm doing. I'm sharing with you what I remember from long ago, and I'm learning, I'm ex excited to learn new things. There's an upper plate, that's a T. There's a lower plate. Those are phrases that I think are still used, I'm guessing. I think of the upper plate as a bunch of sedimentary rock layers, limestone, shale, sandstones, let's say. I think of the lower plate as a bunch of metamorphic rock. Metamorphic gneiss. This is from the Shushwap metamorphic complex in British Columbia, personally collected by moi, that's French, with Jerome Lessman. He's French, Swiss. What's a metamorphic core complex? Well, it's not like this anymore. This metamorphic rock is exposed to have this metamorphic core complex develop into truly a metamorphic core complex, we somehow get rid of this upper plate sedimentary cover and we lift the underlying metamorphic rock. I don't know, let's do a, let's do a before and after. Okay, so is this what it looks like before? I got questions right off the bat. Is it truly metamorphic rock that's down there fully formed in the deeper levels of the crust, that's sitting beneath this shallower, lower temperature, lower pressure rock that's sedimentary in nature? Like, is it already metamorphic? Or is this after when we actually form the metamorphic core complex, is that when we make the metamorphic rocks? I don't know the answer. Does anybody? Pause, dramatic effect, draw what is now the Shushwap, or the Pioneer, or the Albion. These are just a few names I have in my head, or the Kettle, whatever. These metamorphic core complexes are places where you have 
lower plate material that has now at the surface, you can walk around, you can go collect from the lower plate, the metamorphic material. But a very important part of this I got to remind you again what we're doing. I'm not reading the live chat. I see Jerome's here. Hi, Jerome. I'm teaching something that's in my head that almost certainly is wrong. I don't want to be confusing here. You know what I'm doing. I'm going to say it one more time. This is what I have off the top of my head without reading for 30 years. This is what I remember from 1980 frickin' 8 that these upper plates are normal faults. What? These metamorphic car complexes represent extension of the crust. That I'm confident on. When you see a metamorphic core complex, I'm hitting this one hard because I know this to be true. These meta I'm excited now. Daddy's excited. When these metamorphic core complexes show up, they are telling a story of crustal extension. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not screwing around now. We're going to talk about the Eocene between 60 and 40 million years ago, right? This whole winter. The Eocene is a tremendous time of crustal extension. That might be a surprise to you. Think of last fall with the exotic terrain series. Everything's <laughs> crashing in. Everything's colliding. Even if it's oblique collision, everything's under compression. Do you remember? Trip down memory lane. The pizza boxes, Daryl Cow and San Juan Islands. Insular superterrain, giving away Wednesday. Insular superterrain, intermontane superterrain, Solecia. Everything's coming in or we're slamming into something else, but we are compressing, we are contracting, we are um, squeezing. It's a fender bender. Maybe this is one way to say how this winter will be different. A lot of what we will do when we are clearly in the Eocene time, when we're doing all this stuff that these dudes are talking about in their paper, in their proposal, we're extending the crust. Can you see this? Who knows? I can't see my frickin' camera. The metamorphic core complexes are an extension story. The chalice magmas, yeah, I gotta say it. They are an extension story. What? Why? We got 26 shows. That's why these metamorphic core complexes are important. So, how much of this is right? Probably not much, but what's in red is correct. I'm not backing away from that. There are normal faults, low angle normal faults, sometimes called detachment faults where this upper plate material, which presumably was kind of over everything, is slid away. We'll have to come up with an analogy for that too. But we slide this upper plate material away, we lift elevator, geologic elevator, we lift material to the surface, and we expose this metamorphic material. Do you remember migmatites or myelinites? I haven't used myelinite before, but migmatite we looked at a fair amount. Real squiggly stuff. I guess I don't have any with me. I think there's a lot of migmatites or myelinites in these zones of detachment, in these normal fault areas. So I, we, we, we got to have at least one session on, it's almost the top of the hour. Hang on, I got this phone. So, I'm interested in metamorphic core complexes. I will study them hard for the first time with you. Uh, the other thing I want to do before we quit, oh God, am I really going to do it? Rocky Mountain, I said I was going to do it, let's do it. 
Okay. So you know the part where I said it was going to be an hour? You knew that wasn't going to happen, right? Can you hear me when my back is to you, by the way? All right. I'm super pissed about this second camera thing and, and how it must be something I'm doing. But that's, I guess, my goal before Wednesday is to figure out why those cameras get switched and I can't switch them back. It happened in two tests that I did a week ago. And you're like, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, I know it's okay, but I like things to be just right. I just like things to be just right. Here we go, Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains, in less than 10 minutes, according to me, 25 years ago. You know it's wrong. You're like, why are you wasting my time? I'm wasting your time, because I like to, number one, sue me. Secondly, I want to show you how much I will be learning with you this winter about the Rocky Mountains, because this is where I'm starting from. An outdated, sketchy, impossible to comprehend, basic cartoon version of the Rockies. Here we go. The Rocky Mountains is a construction project. Oh, boy. Laramide. Orogeny is a mountain building event. Sounds kind of dirty. Orogeny. The Rocky Mountains began to form 90 million years ago. Probably not right. And stopped building 30 million years ago. Probably not right. You know what we're doing, right? I don't have to say it again. Well, how are we going to build the Rocky Mountains? They're not right at the margin of North America. The Rocky Mountains, our biggest mountain range, are like a full day's drive at least inland from the Pacific Ocean. Why don't we have the Andes, in other words? Why, don't, why isn't our biggest mountain range right on the west coast? Why is it so far inland? Well, it involves a collision between old North America, which is the size of North America before the exotic terrains were acquired, and these things called exotic terrains. Robert Hildebrand, oh no. So we clearly have a distinction. We hit this real hard last fall, the exotic terrain A to Z series. We talked about significant differences between old North America with a craton and a platform overlying and an old west coast at the red line of that old North American continent for a long, long time. And then in the last 200 million years, all these uh, green things have come in, many of them with an oceanic origin. Not quite that simple. We spent 26 shows last fall talking about all the complications in this exotic terrain story. But up until 15 years ago, my talk was the Rockies are the result of basically a continent versus continent collision between old North America against all of these exotic terrains acting as one, acting as the other continent. So like the Himalayas or like the Appalachians or like any other convergent continent versus continent collision, you have a non-volcanic mountain range. You contract the crust, you make either reverse or thrust faults, and you deform this rock as all of these guys are fighting against the old North American continent. And the result are these folded sedimentary rocks, these metamorphic rocks, these granite in the core. That's the hallmark of a continent versus continent collision. Again, folded sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, granite in the core, no volcanoes. 
because there's no subduction. This fighting with this. Okay, well, if you buy that in general, the students would write that down. I'm talking about 30 or 20 years ago now. But then the students would start asking, It'd be late in the quarter, so we'd have a rapport. And they'd start saying, well, I thought you said these terrains started to accrete one by one. That's wrong. I thought you said those, those terrains started to accrete one by one 200 million years ago. Why, don't the, why didn't the Rockies start 200 million years ago? Why did you wait till 90 million years ago? And then I would come back and go, well, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> but I think you need enough terrains to accrete until you have enough mass to fight against Old North America, and therefore the Laramide orogeny begins 90. We have no Rockies before 90 million years ago. You coming in late? I'm talking about stuff that's no longer true, but it's where I am mentally from 20 years ago. And then they go, well, okay, I guess, but how did those, how did those terrains get here? And I say, well, there used to be a big ocean plate called the Farallon Plate and it's abducted beneath old North America and just brought these terrains one after another, one after another, until there's enough terrain material, again, to accrete. You get enough bumblebees splattering on the windshield until you start cracking the windshield. What? And they go, well, how'd the terrains get on the plate? And where'd they come from? Well, I don't know, but... They probably came from the other side of the ocean. <laughs> They're like, what? How'd they get on the plate? Well, I don't know, but they're clearly exotic to North America. Well, well, why, did the, why, why aren't the Rockies still? This, this, this is me talking to students 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Why did the Rockies stop then? Why aren't the Rockies still growing? They say, well, we don't have terrains coming in anymore because we started crossing these Pacific rise and the San Andreas Fault started to form. Are these numbers correct? I don't know. Is flat slab subduction a thing? Or is it an idea proposed a generation ago that doesn't really have data supporting it? Like, we know about tomography now. We know about ocean plates that are in the mantle. Are we really changing the angle of subduction through this story? And so you might, you might be thinking, uh, I don't know why you're talking about the Rocky Mountains right now, and I don't know why you'll be talking about the Laramide Orogeny and the Rocky Mountains for much of this winter. Are you really talking about that? And I, think, I think the answer is yes. First of all, I want to learn new stuff about the Rockies, but second of all, I think understanding Rocky Mountain geology will help inform more details with the North Cascades team. I think we need to go east. I think we need to leave Washington this winter and follow these Eocene metamorphic core complexes, follow this extensional stuff. And by the way, that brings up, isn't the Laramide orogeny a compressional story? And aren't you saying that in the middle of this time frame, the Eocene, there's major extensional stuff happening all the way into the Rockies? That doesn't, that doesn't work with this. I agree. I'm looking forward to learning new things. Okay. Before we quit, I don't know why, I was going to say, before I quit, I want to try to share my screen and show you some Gary Paul photos, but I don't even have the right camera. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try that. I can see the live stream photo of me, the video of me, and I can see the live chat, and I don't want to screw with it anymore. So... I thank you for joining us this morning. It's now time to hit your uppercase. If you're new to us, that's the time where we do live question and answer. I, I don't know where we will be right now with this. 
but I guess you would be asking about this winter's plan or, well, I'm not going to make questions for you. I'm going to answer your questions the best I can. And then we'll uh, sign off with a little toast uh, in 10 minutes or so, and then, I don't know, I might stick around with some of you and test a couple things, but I'm gun shy at the moment. The device nine, <laughs> uppercase. How did the Rockies form again? <laughs> Stay tuned this winter. Mr. Tony, let me get this. Mr. Tony, who I met at the last pop-up event, nice to see you here, Mr. Tony. Did the crustal extension cause other large basalt lava flows? I don't think so. Basalt lava flows, oh, interesting question. You know, we don't want to get too cute here. We want to stay true to the rocks, to the field mapping, to the faults. We want to stick to the field data. As I did last fall, I think I was pretty good with that. I think I was trying to stick to what we know and major observations that we have about these far-flung places. In other words, I want to stick away, uh, stay away from uh, ocean plates. There's so much ongoing debate about which ocean plate was where and what direction was it moving. Uh, we'll do a little bit of that, but we want to stick to the rocks and the ground truths that we for sure have after more than a century of mapping. And off the top of my head, Mr. Tony, I can't think of a bunch of basalts that are Eocene in age. I'm scrolling back now. Kyle, are Washington's coal mines part of our Eocene story? They are. I don't know if I'll hit it too hard. I mean, there's... I guess there's a chance some of you are tuning in because you're plant fossil people and you love uh, Eocene fossils, leaf fossils. And you're like, oh, goody, 26 shows on... on uh, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum and global climatic conditions and all sorts of uh, crazy uh, palm fronds that are in central Washington. I don't think we're doing that. We might a little bit. But I don't think that's going to help me with the North Cascades work. I'll keep coming back to that. You know, I have, I think, more than 100 scientific papers in my little folder with the Eocene. And every, I don't tend to do this very often, but every once in a while I'll go, oh my God, how am I going to cover all this? I kind of forget, you know. So I have to frame it towards the North Cascades team, the dream team. I have to keep asking myself, is this going to be helpful in understanding this gadget nice in the Chelan Migmatite and the uh, Ross Lake Fault Zone and the Cooper Mountain Basilisk? I'll keep coming back to that. And if the answer is no, if talking about uh, the size of the palm fronds uh, in the Swak Formation. Interesting. Uh, it's not going to help me directly with the North Cascades work, and so I'll keep, that'll be kind of my tether, I think. I'm still back quite a ways, but I just want to catch some, slow the live chat down and ask some more. I'll, I'll try to pick up the pace here. Uh, John, I will share my screen next time. I'm embarrassed. I can't do it now, I don't think. Um, if you go to nickzentner.com, that's my website. That's not my YouTube channel. That's my website, nickzentner.com. And I spent some time last night restructuring the home page, nickzentner.com. And in the upper right, God, I wanted to share the screen. In the upper right, there's 101, 351, and the word Eocene in the very upper right-hand corner. And I am going to have key scientific papers there. I think there's four or five of them right now, just as kind of placeholders. But I do want to do what I was doing with 351. In other words, share some of these papers that I'm working with, and I, I think it's popular enough that you guys, some of you guys, want to look at those papers carefully and read them and reread them, just like I'm reading them and rereading them. And that will be our textbook, I guess. So yes, those papers will be available, none, none specifically from today, but uh, that will be a, I do think that, I, I do think that this winter is going to be kind of a nice, I hope, a nice uh, combination of backyard stuff, classroom stuff, science papers, in other words, kind of taking what I consider some of the best stuff from these other formats and putting them together in one place. 
Aren't the Rockies still growing? I don't think so, but I guess it depends on what you're talking about, Mike. Like the Teton Fault is still active, but I view that as more of a basin and range story than a Rocky Mountain story. But we can, we'll, we'll, we'll parse that out. Um, automatic scroll, that hasn't changed. <laughs> Scrolling back again. Uh, Kent, I thought there was a rift evident in the southern Rockies extending north. You're, yes, there are some active current things in the Rockies, but that's one thing, so these comments are helpful. That's one thing that I will have to be careful to frame. I guess that's my favorite word today. Frame is when I talk about the Rockies, what actually am I talking about? I'm talking about building the Rocky Mountains, not bringing in a young rift or a, big, a young normal fault or a new lava flow in the San Juan volcanic field or something. So that's helpful. Um, backwards. What's the name of the proposal you referenced at the beginning of the stream? Charles, I'll give you the title again, but it's not available online, and Mike and team wasn't comfortable with me posting the whole proposal. Uh, and I think that's a fair thing for them to request. It, it's got a bunch of... It's not appropriate for me to post a proposal. So, I, well, I'll read the title to you again, but I don't think you'll find anything. Burning down the house. That's really part of the title. I love it. <laughs> Burning down the house. Talking heads. Same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Burning down the house. Investigating the relationships between magmatic flare-ups, crustal rheology, and arc collapse. Volcanic arc. Still going backwards. Do zircon's clocks get reset, and what does it take for this to happen? I don't know how to answer that. Um, that involves the details of Mike's work and others who work with zircon. Actually, Stacia works with zircons as well. Um, I think the short answer is no, because they're getting so much great information out of these zircons going back so far. There are this. I'm not even sure of this. There's, it, you can get one little sand grain called a zircon crystal in a granite, and there's different rims, like a jawbreaker. There's different layers inside, and there's different ages on that one zircon crystal. So you may know more about this than me, North Scotty nerd, but I, I don't know of a problem with resetting zircons, but maybe I'll learn that. Geofire, would the Rockies extension be simultaneous with the reverse of the river flow deposits in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, river flow deposits as I know of them in the Pacific Northwest are a much younger story, younger than the Miocene, younger than the flood basalts. But if you're thinking about something older, then perhaps, but I don't know. How big are these metamorphic core complexes? That's an interesting question, Lorraine. Like a county size? Uh, I don't know how else to describe it right now. Rollback during this period? Yeah, we'll get into that rollback stuff with Jeff Tepper. We'll probably get Jeff Tepper to involve and join us live. Hell, I can't even see myself in the right camera right now, but that's the other thing that I'm hoping to do is get practiced enough with this new setup. We haven't had a blorp, have we? We haven't had a internet problem. So I, I like this setup. Cameras, I don't think, are as HD as I was hoping they'd be, but whatever. But I'm confident I'll be get some of these folks with us live, on screen, like two heads or one head talking to us and joining us. That's my, that's my hope. How old are the Rockies compared to the Alps and the Himalayas? Well, the Himalayas are still active, David. Hey, David, yeah, from uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. Uh the Himalayas are still active. The Rockies are no longer active as I view them. The Alps are no longer active. I don't know the dates of the Alps. Kenyan, just Washington Rockies, Canada, Southern, how extensive? Well, technically, there are no Rocky Mountains in Washington, so maybe that's confusing to some who are watching from a long way away. I met get backcountry Gary for the first time in the flesh at a couple of the Popov live streams, and he's the guy that gifted us one of these beautiful photos. We have another one framed in our home. 
Beautiful mountains, not the Rocky Mountains. So I guess that's another... Yeah, we have a worldwide audience here, so I will have, even for those that are weak in geography who live here, uh, I have to be very careful about making sure you can see what I'm talking about with the Rocky Mountains and how they are different than the North Cascades. Will I cover the severe thrust? I don't know. The severe thrust, I think, is too old for any of this, but, yeah, I mean, I can toss in with this, uh, like, I'm rolling my eyes because I took an advanced structural geology class from Dave Rogers in Pocatello, Idaho, in the fall of 1986. I remember some all-nighters drawing these ramps and flats with these thrust faults in southeastern Idaho and westernmost Wyoming. I antler orogeny, severe orogeny. I had no contextual framework, you know, and just like dropped into this place. It was my first time living in Idaho, period. I didn't even know where these place names were. And I'm drawing and redrawing these thrust fault geometries where the fault is, is... So I'm truly dusting off those. I haven't thought about the antler orogeny since 1989. Never even heard the phrase till right now. It just popped into my head. Val, the days and times for this live stream, every Saturday morning right now at 9 a.m. Pacific and every Wednesday afternoon, 2 p.m. Pacific. I chose those two days because it's best to get in here at those times. I chose those times of day to try to work with all the time zones around the world and try to mix it up so that we could have possibly a different audience on Wednesday than we have on Saturday mornings. George Walsh talks about hot spots. Where was the hot spot during the Eocene? You're saying, where was the hot spot? Well, maybe there were multiple hot spots. If you're talking about the Yellowstone mantle plume or a Yellowstone hot spot, sure, we'll be talking about that. Are there other hot spots to consider? Is there some kind of hot spot concept with some of these magmatic flare ups? Do we have these age sweeps of magmas that sweep younger or sweep older outside of eastern Washington? Like, isn't there a sweep of magmas that get younger and younger as you go down through Nevada? This is all stuff that potentially can work together if I'm up to it. And if I'm not, we'll just uh, enjoy each other's company. Okay, I'm down to live now, I think. Hit the button. Um, yeah, we'll wrap it up in the next five minutes. Uh, the West is big, travel. He's uh, suggesting some opportunities, multiple hotspots, question mark. I'm scrolling back again, but I'm closer to live. Will you explain the Canadian sedimentary Rockies as well as us granitic Rockies? Robert, thank you. Well, that's another thing I use. I'll just do this quick. This is how we'll quit. Uh, yeah. This will be a little primer for our Rocky Mountain stuff. And um, uh, before I forget, I'll say this. So I'm thinking November, not sure. Generally, I think November is, is kind of repackaging and thinking about the exotic terrain stuff that we did last fall. There's so much there, and I've forgotten most of it. I have to re-watch some of those shows, at least listen to that stuff, and kind of, you know, I don't want to just jump right into the Eocene and brand new stuff. I want us to go back in November and remember where we were, and those that are brand new, get us, get, get you up and running. I think that's important. And then by December, we'll truly be in the Eocene, and I will somehow be combining the good stuff that we learned in 351 with some of these new areas that I'm operating in. I don't know how that's going to work. Why did I say all that? I don't remember. Um, oh, yeah. So when I eventually get to talking about the Rockies, I don't know when that's going to be. Am I going to hold off on the Rockies till January, maybe? Is there a reason to get into the Rockies much sooner? I'll have to decide that once I think about it and meet with you a few more times. But 
you know, here's, here's Ellensburg, and here's the North Cascades, which again is the primary focus of this whole thing. I think of the Rockies as through here. And more to Bob or Robert's question, uh, I remember teaching this that once you're in Wyoming and Utah, oh, it's even farther. Um, I'll just do it cartoonishly like this. I remember a significant difference. Oh, it's just coming back to me right now. I haven't thought about this in a long time. There are, so the, the, the Rockies in general are a compressional story, as I was trying to show in that other cartoon. It's a squeezing story. It's a shortening story. But the building of the southern Rockies in Wyoming and Colorado, for instance, in Utah, is generally, cartoonishly, a... Uh, higher angle reverse fault, a higher angle reverse fault where you squeeze the crust and the hanging wall goes up. The fault is steeper than 45 degrees. And so you're bringing craton, metamorphic craton, up to the surface, almost like a grand scale metamorphic core complex, I guess. I haven't really thought about it. But it's not a metamorphic core complex because it's a compressional story, just decided. So we have these reverse faults in the southern Rockies, basically lifting this metamorphic craton and basically getting that overlying sedimentary rock to go away. But on reverse faults, not normal faults, not core complex, reverse faults. Compare that with the northern Rockies, cartoonishly, generally, from 30 years ago, the Montana Rockies and into Alberta, let's say. And those are thrust faults, generally, which are a much lower angle fault. I'll need to use some props for that if we get into this. And that's basically taking sedimentary layers and compressing them, but you're stacking or you're taking thrust sheets as they're known. Boy, I'm getting excited now. I haven't thought about this in a long time. That was even true for southern Idaho. So some of these thrust sheets are down here. But you're, you're making the northern Rockies. Can I do it for you? We can do the northern Rockies by, by breaking the layer cake and shoving old layers of limestone up onto these ramps and flats and making the Rockies above Calgary or Edmonton or... Glacier National Park, uh, you've got the old layers sitting on top of the young layers, and they're sitting like that because of these thrust faults and this crustal compression that way. This is both laramidorogeny, but there's the style of mountain building during that laramidorogeny time, kind of apples and oranges as far as the architecture, the, the building of that. Obviously, I can't stop. He can't stop. Avon is here. Uh, R-E-E -E in Golden Horn. I don't know what you mean, Frank. The Golden Horn is a pluton up on Washington Pass. I don't know what R-E-E. Oh, rare earth elements. I don't know. I barely know what a rare earth element is. I know it's funky as heck. Actually, that's one of the papers that's waiting for you. NickSentner.com. Click on the word Eocene in the upper right-hand corner. Mike Eddy. I'm pretty sure that's true. I've got a Mike Eddy Golden Horn paper there if you want to just dive in right away. Okay, that's plenty. A toast to you. It's just water. I don't know, maybe at some point I'll uh, smuggle a few things in here Saturday mornings. Empty building. Here's to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Wish I could see myself. <laughs> Take two. Here's to you and your health.
I can't stop yelling. It's an empty auditorium. And it's an intimate style. It's just me. I'm 12 inches away from the camera. And yet, I hope you can feel the, the genuineness of this. I've been doing this stuff a long time, and yet I still get cranked up. And I think we all have teachers in our past that we remember almost exclusively for their enthusiasm. And you can tell when it's fake or when it's not there. We pick up on that energy. And I hope you can sense that this is not manufactured. I genuinely enjoy this stuff. And I genuinely enjoy having you with us here in the classroom. We'll look for you next time. Session B, probably called the main events or something. I don't know. I'll maybe change my mind. But session B will be Wednesday afternoon, 2 o'clock Pacific time. What's that for you? For us, it's in the middle of the day, and there'll be students walking around the hallway and everything, but I'll have the doors locked and uh, I'll be visiting with you then. Thank you, I love you, and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Okay, if you wanna stick around, um, pressure's off. We're done. It's 1030. But I, uh, maybe I can solve a couple of these things since everything's all set up. I got two, two cameras and the light is on both cameras. So I think both cameras are active. But my melon thing, God dang, is flipped. So it says that I'm using the Brio camera, which is this camera I've been talking to, and I hope, <laughs> I hope I've been talking into this camera, even though it says, no, here's what I, thank you for your patience. The camera view that I have in Melon shows the secondary camera. It didn't switch back to the camera that I was apparently using. And so I haven't, I haven't even taken this video switcher out of the box, and that might, that might solve my problems. But now I'm supposed to be looking into the Brio camera. And do you see the other one? There's a delay. Hang on. Yeah. Now, in Melon, I'm talking into Brio, but you're over here, right? Again, there's a delay, but uh, this is the stream cam that I just bought. I don't even really, I was going to use it as kind of a, oh wait, can I even see what I'm doing now? I see I can't, I'm still flying blind. So something in Melon, I must be doing something in Melon to, to confuse, I don't even know. So why should I even try to do stuff if I can't see myself? Let me try it anyway. Let me try to share the screen. This was my plan to share the screen, but if I'm flying blind, I don't even I can't even really see what I'm doing. Chrome tab So this should pick up. I'm going to get the live chat out of the way. I, I'm not going to look at the live chat. I'm still lo I'm looking at the live broadcast right now. Okay, yeah. So that worked, but I'm still I'm still here. And and uh, can you see my cursor going around? You should be able to. Let me hold on for a second. So you can. Uh, there's a good. 10 second delay here. Yeah, you can see my 
uh, it, finger. So if I, you can see my finger. So I can go to that golden horn baffle of paper by Mike, and I can look at his, I'll wait again. I can even, it's just the camera thing. It's just the camera thing. See, this is, this is a step up, isn't it? Like I can make this window bigger, I think. I'm flying blind again, though. That's another issue I have. If I, if I, totally, if I totally hog the screen with my screen sharing, then I, I'm like paralyzed. I can't see anything. I haven't figured that out yet on how to do that. Stop sharing. Oh, stop sharing. Okay. Oh, wait now. Hold it. Hold it. Did that did that get me back on the right camera? Am I am I back to the finger camera? No, I'm not. In Melon, I'm on the finger camera, and does it say I'm on the finger camera? <laughs> the Brio in other words. No, it says I'm in the Logitech yeah, it's still it's still effed up. Uh, I'm going to try this one more time, and then I think we'll quit. I assume you can hear me through this whole thing. That's what I'll. This is the last test I'll have. Chrome tab again. Share. And I've got different templates. Oh. God, I got a ways to go here, man. I'm on this camera number two. Can I do full? I know, I should do all this in private, but it's just handy to have you here. Entire screen, let me try entire screen. Is that the entire screen? Oh, it's still with that layout? Oh, entire screen, God. All right. Well, I'm going to go back to the finger camera even though, oh, maybe I am. No, I'm not. Still screwed up. <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go HD. So this is the, this is the built-in camera, I think. No, it's not. That's, okay. Oh, boy. So um, I think I have, oh, what is that? Is that HD now? Wherever you are, huh, huh, whatever you, wherever you are, I will be testing these cameras again between now and Wednesday. And so you might see me pop up live without any kind of announcement. And the few of you who have been able to help live have been very helpful but this is, you know how this goes, man. This is like two steps forward and then like three steps back. And it feels like progress, but boy, in moments like this, I'm doing something in real time to get everything reversed. And I have to solve that. Otherwise, I'm going to be gun shy to do any of this other stuff. And I'll just stick with the, with the finger camera and call it a day. I don't even know where to look. So I will turn away and say... Thank you. I love you. And we'll see you Wednesday. I do appreciate you coming. Wherever you are, I appreciate you coming. End stream. Have a good day. See you Wednesday.